I apologize for interrupting your lunch conversation. Um, I hope it continues after lunch and after our speakers, but it's the sound, it's that pleasant hubbub of, uh, of a conference that's going well, people interested in the topics, hopefully exchanging ideas, comparing notes, and so we're happy to have that sort of atmosphere and spirit here. And hopefully uh, everything this morning uh, has gone well. Um, any sort of general reaction to what you've heard and seen? Well, good. That's, uh, that's precisely what we'd hoped for. And um, uh, we, we look forward to continuing that very same response and engendering that same sort of reaction this afternoon. Before I introduce our first uh, speaker today at lunch, I'd like to take just a moment and thank a couple of people who are in the audience. We, uh, of course, uh, everyone here is a distinguished guest, but there are a couple of folks I'd like to, to draw attention to in particular. Um, Dr. Michael Mahalio from the Appalachian College Association, the president of the Appalachian College Association. Uh, Michael, before he was president of ACA, was president and chancellor at Davis and Elkins College. And so we are delighted to have Michael here wearing both hats, his Davis and Elkins hat and also his ACA hat, and we appreciate his joining us. Dr. Clark Egner, our vice chancellor for international education and initiatives from our higher education policy commission, our state level governing board. Clark, we're delighted that you're here with us. Clark and I have known each other for a long time and there is no more devoted champion and advocate for international higher education than Clark. And what he's done since he's gone to HEPC has just been extraordinary. So Clark, thank you again for, for joining us and being a part of this. And Kate Spies from the Office of the Secretary of Education and the Arts. Is Kate here? Oh, hello, Kate, how are you? Nice to see you again. Kate, thank you for joining us. The Office of the Secretary of Education and the Arts, uh, Secretary Kay Goodwin, um, very generous in her support of this conference and its activities. So, so thanks to, to the three of you and the organizations you represent for your support of our work. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Kevin Ann Willey. Um, I will refer to you as we have done throughout our sessions um, to read the biographies of our presenters and our speakers that were provided to you in the conference registration materials. I'm going to supplement those today at lunch with just a few brief comments. Um, if you read the biography of Kevin Ann Willey, you know she's vice president and the editorial page editor at the Dallas Morning News. And we are honored to host her here today as a very special guest representing the Pulitzer Prize Board. And so through her, we extend profound thanks to the Pulitzer Prize Centennial Campfires Initiative and the Federation of State Humanities Councils for creating both the intellectual space and providing the financial support that enable us to gather here this week to celebrate Pearl S. Buck's life and legacy. In addition to their shared connection to the Pulitzer Prize, Kevin and Pearl are both champions of the importance and value of writing. As part of her profile as a distinguished alumna of Northern Arizona University, Kevin observed that good writing is important and it is a skill. Good writers will always have a job somewhere. If you are informed, smart, and can see both sides of an issue, there will always be a market for that. And I suspect Pearl would agree with that assessment wholeheartedly. And so to tell us more about the centennial celebration, and a century of extraordinary writing produced by Pulitzer Prize winners, I am very pleased to introduce Kevin Ann Willey. Wonderful, well thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here for a wonderful event that you all have put together to honor the groundbreaking work of Pearl S. Buck and the 100th anniversary of the Pulitzer Prizes. I am delighted to be here and to share the stage with Dr. Kong Giao and such a variety and impressive list of scholars. 
I do bring with me greetings from the Pulitzer Board and especially from the Pulitzer Prize Board's Centennial Committee. I'd like to thank the West Virginia Humanities Council, West Virginia University, and the Erickson Alumni Center, of course, for conceiving and executing this event. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Pulitzer Prizes, their history, why it's important, particularly in this day and age, to celebrate the 100th anniversary. So I'm gonna suggest that we start by setting the stage with a video. Um, it was produced for the Pulitzer Prizes by the museum in Washington, D.C. It's 12 minutes long, and I think you'll like it. I just sat down to write about the experience. So to have won the, the court surprise for that um, was just, you know, a moment he got. The Pulitzer Prizes were announced today. They honor distinguished works of literature, music, drama, and print journalism. Bob Woodward hired me when he was Metro editor. To this day, he is the most resourceful reporter I've ever met. Eileen Wilson was working at a small paper. She stumbled on a big story and grabbed onto it and didn't let go. She was able to, to tell their stories, which also told our story, you know, as a country, and who we were and what decisions we were making. The poets look at the cream of the crop and, and those pieces that I think resonate beyond their particular topic area. This was a recognition that fashion really does live beyond the runway and fashion magazines. Clothes tell us something really specific about culture. It's like the, the billboard for a period of time. I feel that I am writing for people who don't have a voice. There was one fellow in Morgan Stanley who had my picture and a red circle and a slash through my face in his office. The Army literally was calling my boss, telling him to kill the story, and when that didn't work, they called my boss's boss. And as soon as we did our reporting, the cat was out of the bag, and the Army immediately stopped stripping them of VA benefits. Journalists who do this type of work, you could either say it's a, a calling or maybe a personality defect. They do it because they have to do it whether it's the people that dug through the data or walked through the war zones. It's this act of bearing witness. I swung my graphic around and held it, and I could only hope that it turned out the way that I looked at it through the fire. We've seen some incredibly brave war correspondents when I arrived 
1862, Wes Gallagher, who was the AP president, believed that the American publishers would be willing to hear the truth about Vietnam, and he said, go ahead and report everything you see. And Peter, don't make any mistakes. We became very aware through the AP and others that the Pentagon, the military high command, and the White House and State Department were not happy with that coverage. But frankly, we didn't give a damn. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. It never looked as terrible as it was. And it made her wonder if hell was a pretty place, too. I still are! You never really understand the person until you consider things from his point of view. And to get to know these people, you have to go where they went. It's a desire to know how our democracy works, how it really works. In both Master of the Center and the Power Bill, I examined power for one man. If you can figure out how he did it and explain it adequately to people, you'll be filling a gap in our knowledge about how political power really works. Robert Moses basically said, anyone who wants a contract from the city or state will never speak to you. So when I started, not only was there not a book, there wasn't a single magazine or newspaper article examining public authorities as a source of political power. To work for seven years, basically with no one terribly interested in what you're doing, uh, being broke a lot of the time, but then at the end of it to have a Pulitzer surprise. That's really something. Editorial cartoons are so vitally important to democracy. The first Pulitzer winning cartoon, you can understand it 100, 1,000 years from now in terms of social justice, human rights, and really just the powerful visual. We can get away with so much that if we are strong, the rest of journalism is. And the tough part about being a cartoonist, your beat is everything. First gleam and then Merrill, the high times were finished. Soon U.S. wealth was 14 trillion diminished. The Pulitzer music category started in 1943 with William Schumann, and just shortly after that, Aaron Copeland, Virgil Thompson, Charles Ives, iconic American figures who really helped define what the American voices. It was the Pulitzer first jazz in the category usually reserved for classical music. Blood on the Fields traces the journey of an African couple sold into slavery in the United States. I am the 2015 Pulitzer Prize winner for a piece commemorating life on the Andosite coal mining region of Pennsylvania. In a certain sense, it is a kind of poetic history. Two roads diverge in the yellow woods. I love my crooked feet, shaped by vanity and work shoes made to outlast belief. It is like what we imagine knowledge to be, dark, salt, clear, moving, utterly free. Gwendolyn Brooks, who was the first African-American poet to get the prize with somebody whose work has shaped generations of writers. My questions as a poet are really simple, and I think they come down to the sense of uh, what do we do to one another and why. And I think what a poem does is it brings us to a place where we can become aware of all that we wish we knew how to say. Good evening. Last week they handed out the Pulitzer Prizes. The gold medals went not to a great metropolitan newspaper, but to two weekly papers in North Carolina. Their editors decided to fight and expose the Ku Klux Klan. What very brave newspaper editors did in the South during the Civil Rights Movement, at the time when the KKK was not just uh, three scary letters, but a reality, was amazingly brave. Throughout the history of the prizes, there have also been 
individual colonists who have suffered because of the stances they took, and yet they persisted. It is imperative that each of us examine our own heart and conscience and determine what part we play in creating a society which permits a man to be murdered because of his desire to be free and equal under the law. I don't want people just to think, I want them to feel when they look at pictures, because that's the only way you're going to get a real response. It was a routine rescue, and all of a sudden everything went to garbage. I still remember thinking to myself, I don't want to see them hit. Without words, the best photographs will convey immediately something of importance. I had no idea of the impact, and I still don't understand it even today. We all felt attacked. Everybody felt attacked, and that gave us the energy to cover this story. No matter how massive a story it is, how disastrous it may be, the human element is the thing that reaches out and touches people. We wanted the 1986 for coverage of the Colombian volcano that caused a mudslide. I think 25,000 people or more were killed. One of the most tragic things to see was this little girl who was trapped in the rubble. They couldn't dislodge her. And, you know, those are the kind of things that break your heart. And I think that probably resonated with so many people. That one little girl, six months later, I found the mother. And she felt like it gave her daughter's death meaning to have been kind of the symbol of this horrible tragedy, which brought a lot of help, of course, to the town and to the people. And I think the most important thing about any award is shining the light back on the story. Makes me, you know, hang on to that night where you can change the world. When you look down at the list of winners, these are all people who took risks, who really wanted to help people to understand what was really going on. The one word that I come back to is impact. Bullet surprise is vital in keeping the ice rail cartoon alive. It's the announcement each year that there's one book of poems that ought to be read because it's that important and it's that powerful. I think it's an amazing documentation of who we are as human beings. The Pulitzer Prize is just the one that matters the most. It is shorthand that means that this is lasting. We live in a world where everything changes faster and faster, so nothing seems to endure. But one of the things that has endured for a century is the symbolic value of the pure surprise. Well, that's quite a walk down memory lane. Um, every time I experience this video, I'm struck by the passion that drives the people behind every one of the works that we just saw flash by. And it's that same passion, I think, that has driven this year's centennial celebrations of the Pulitzer Prize. There are literally hundreds of Pulitzer celebration events going on this year. And I'd like to just take a moment to briefly describe that landscape. First of all, there are four national marquee events, each of which has its own theme and each of which is designed to highlight a specific aspect of the Pulitzer Prize body of work. All the marquees have been cross-disciplinary, and by that I mean that they incorporate the best of American journalism, American literature, and the arts, American arts. The first marquee, which we can go to a slide, yes, was in St. Petersburg, Florida in March. 
That was in partnership with the Pointer Institute for Media Studies, and it focused on the voices of social justice and equality. The second marquee was in Los Angeles in May, in partnership with the Los Angeles Times and USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and it focused on war, migration, and the quest for peace. The third marquee was in Dallas in June. Its title was The People, The Presidency, and The Press, and it was a very unusual collaboration between the Pulitzer Board, the Dallas Morning News, and the three presidential libraries that are in Texas, LBJ, Bush 41, Bush 43. And I just came from Cambridge for the fourth and final marquee of the year. Um, this one was in collaboration with the Neiman Foundation and was titled Power, Accountability, and Abuse. Each of these has, focused top, has featured top caliber scholars, journalists, artists, policymakers, Pulitzer Prize winners. But wait, there's more. The Pulitzer Board partnered um, nearly two years ago with the Federation of State Humanities Councils in 46 states and territories on a $1.7 million project aimed at deepening the public discourse around the values embodied by the Pulitzer Prizes in a much more organic sort of way. Funded by the Pulitzer Board, the Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and the Knight Foundation, the project became known as our Campfire Initiative. It was named in the interest of fanning the flames of light and passion across the country. So each of these humanities councils um, is hosting multiple centennial events. These campfires range in scope from book fairs, poetry slams, journalism workshops, to musical ensembles, panel discussions, and drama readings. The West Virginia Humanities Council, with this event, is a stellar example. Like the marquees, the campfires are designed to highlight the first 100 years of the Pulitzer Prizes and to inspire new audiences for the next hundred years around the values that undergird the prizes. Those values are unstinting fact-finding, well-researched analysis, lucid writing, rigorous self-reflection, cultural discovery, and most important, public service. Now we're gonna click through just a few slides in, in quick succession here just to show you the breadth of what's been going on and is still going on all over the country. You can go to pulitzer.org, we have a new website uh, for more information about the prize celebrations across the country, the history, and the winning work. So let's take a minute and talk a bit about that history. The Pulitzer Prizes were established by Joseph Pulitzer, a Hungarian immigrant who came to this country in the 19th century, unable to speak the language, and at least for a while even to hold a job. His rise to the vanguard of American journalism and the legacy of the prizes that bear his name is testament to American ingenuity, perseverance, and leadership. I commend to you a biography of Joseph Pulitzer named Pulitzer, a Life in Politics, Print, and Power by James McGrath Morris. Joseph Pulitzer was a genuine force of nature, a passionate crusader against government corruption, a fierce competitor who didn't shrink from sensationalism to get the upper hand in circulation wars, and a visionary who was the first to call for the training of journalists at the university level, and who richly endowed his profession. In his will, he gave Columbia University $2 million to start a school of journalism and to establish what became known as the Pulitzer Prizes. A quarter of the funds was to go to prizes or scholarships for, quote, the encouragement of public service, public morals, American literature, and the advancement of education. I've always particularly liked this quote from the father of the prizes. I am deeply interested in the progress and education of journalism, having spent my life in that profession, 
regarding it as a noble profession and one of unequaled importance for its influence upon the minds and morals of the people. I desire to assist in attracting to this profession young men of character and ability, also to help those already engaged in the profession to acquire the highest moral and intellectual training. So the Pulitzer Prizes began with four journalism awards, four letters awards, one education award, and five traveling scholarships. Over the years, the Pulitzer Prizes have morphed into 21 annual awards, 14 journalism categories, five book categories, drama, and music. In many ways, this expansion of categories, of course, is a wonderful thing because more and varied work gets recognized. For those of us on the Pulitzer board, however, this explosion of categories has made for an explosion of work. We on the board have essentially five months to read the three finalists in each of the 21 categories. We're doing this while we're doing our day jobs, by the way. Then we attend a two-day event at Columbia University in April, prepared to argue which of the three finalists in each category deserves the prize. Not that I'm expecting any sympathy here. It is, after all, America's Best Book Club. But it is not a small lift. So let me focus just a bit on the person that this particular conference is all about. For the first decade, the Pulitzer Prizes were awarded. The board declared the winning novel must, quote, depict American life. But after Thornton Wilder's The Bridge of San Luis Rey won the prize despite its Peruvian setting, board members broadened the definition. After 1928, the winner simply would be, quote, the best novel published that year by an American author. The category, by the way, is now called fiction, and the award is given for, quote, distinguished fiction by an American author, preferably dealing with American life. Anyway, the first book to benefit from the 1928 shift came along four years later. In 1932, Sai Zhenzhu, also known as Pearl S. Buck, won the Nobel Prize for the Good Earth. <coughs> Toni Morrison, who won the 1988 Fiction Prize for the Beloved, praised the book, adding wryly that Buck, quote, misled me and made me feel that all writers wrote sympathetically, empathetically, honestly, and forthrightly about other cultures. The Good Earth was the unanimous first choice of the Pulitzer jury, which in 1932 consisted of jurors Jefferson B. Fletcher of Columbia University, Robert M. Lovett of the New Republic, and Hal um, Albert B. Payne. In a January 26, 1932 letter, uh, the, the, the novel jury, Frank Fackenthal, who was the secretary of the Pulitzer Prize Advisory Board, asked the jurors to make no reference to the jury's disagreements, if any, in their report to the board. He asked them to simply list the books in the order of the jury's choice without indicating the ins and outs of the vote. In its report, and we have a copy of it for you, no backup, sorry, we have a copy of it for you there, um, the, rep the jury conceded that it had favorably considered also, Shadow on the Rock by Willa Cather, and The Lady Who Came to Stay by R.E. Spencer, noting, quote, it's a rare year when three such excellent novels appear. Preference was given to The Good Earth, quote, for its epic sweep, its distinct and moving characterizations, its sustained story interest, its simple and yet richly colored style. Now, I wasn't on the board, in the Pulitzer board in 1932, um, to review The Good Earth, uh, but I've been on the board now for eight years, since 2008, and I have thoroughly enjoyed the distinct privilege of reading some of the best of American literature. I expected to joy, enjoy the journalism categories. After all, that's what I'm most familiar with, what I've dedicated some 36 years of my life to. 
and I do enjoy the journalism. Personal favorites, of course, are the editorial writing category, the column writing category, but I'll also never forget the groundbreaking journalism and frankly the very robust board discussion that resulted in awarding the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, known as the Gold Medal, to two organizations for their pursuit in very different ways of the Edward Snowden story. The Guardian US won, both of them won for their revelation of widespread secret surveillance by the National Security Agency. But listen to the distinction. The Guardian US won also for helping through aggressive reporting to spark a debate about the relationship between government and the public over issues of security and privacy. The Washington Post, also for revelation of widespread secret surveillance in the National Security Council, but marked by authoritative and insightful reports that helped the public understand how the disclosures fit into the larger framework of national security. And I have to tell you that few reports can be more significant than the Associated Press's investigation last year of severe labor abuses tied to the supply of seafood to American supermarkets and restaurants, reporting that freed 2,000 slaves, brought perpetrators to justice, and inspired industry reforms. That package of stories won the 2016 gold medal for public service. But I must confess, I especially enjoy the books and drama categories. Maybe it's because I don't do books and drama in my real life. The books and drama provide, for me, another way of learning about the world around us, of telling stories, of discovering truth. Perhaps this should come as no surprise. As a child, one of my favorite fantasies was to be left alone in a library so I could read the books from A to Z. And of course, my first professional aspiration was to write the great American novel. I confess, however, that one book I did not expect to like um, came along the second year I was on the board. It was about a bunch of bankers in the last century. I saw the title and the book jacket and I thought, I'm not really into monetary policy. This is going to be quite a slog. Boy, was I wrong. If you've not read The Lords of Finance, The Bankers Who Broke the World by Leah Quad Ahmed, you should. It's an unusually compelling account of how four powerful bankers around the world played crucial roles in triggering the Great Depression and World War II and ultimately transformed the United States into the world's financial leader. Liaquat Ahmed, by the way, was a first time book writer. He won the Pulitzer in 2010 for history. Makes you want to say, what have you done for me lately? In 2013, that was a blockbuster year for me on the board. The History Award that year went to Frederick Lojval for Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire, and the Making of America's Vietnam. It's a balanced, deeply researched history of how, as French colonial rule faltered, a succession of American leaders moved step by step down the road towards full-blown war. The Biography Award that year went to Tom Rice for The Black Count, Glory, Revolution, Betrayal, and the Real Count of Monte Cristo. This is a compelling story of a forgotten swashbuckling hero of mixed race whose bold exploits were captured by his son, Alexander Dumas, in the famous 19th century novels. I think this book should be a movie. The nonfiction prize that same year went to Gilbert King for Devil in the Grove, Thurgood Marshall and the Groveland Boys, and the Dawn of a New America. It's a richly detailed chronicle of racial injustice in the Florida town of Groveland in 1949, involving four falsely accused black men of rape and, throwing a, and drawing a civil rights crusader and eventual Supreme Court justice into the legal battle. This one's actually being made into a movie as we speak. Both Groveland Boys and Black Count teach more about history, race, and culture 
than any civics or seminar course around, in my opinion, they should be required reading in every high school in America. And of course, then there's this year's drama winner. Anybody know what that one would be? Anything come to mind? Have you heard of Hamilton? <laughs> so Hamilton by Lin-Manuel Miranda. It so rocked my world that a year later, having seen it in the public theater, I still really can't get it out of my head. And there's a confidential side note here. You have not lived until you've heard Ron Chernow, who's the author of the book on which the musical is based, rap about his subject matter. He did a snippet of that at uh, of Lynn manuels script at the Dallas Marquee event on a panel we had featuring three Pulitzer Prize winning presidential biographers and it brought the house down. So in closing, I'm not gonna rap uh, for you about Hamilton, but I will say thank you to each and every one of you involved in this forum. It has never, ever been more important than it is right now to focus on the values of engagement, enlightenment, truth-telling, and inspiration. As we rocket toward what will be, regardless of the outcome, a historic election, each of us must do everything we can to lift up the best of American journalism, scholarship, and the arts. We must inspire new audiences around the importance of the humanities to our democracy. You're doing your part by being here, sponsoring and attending this conference on one of America's literature's greatest. <coughs> Keep doing your part. Sometimes it's hard, but it's important. I'm gonna leave you with a thought from the oft-overlooked late great war correspondent, Martha Gellhorn. I've had it hanging on a wall in my office for many years. All of my reporting life, I have thrown small pebbles into a very large pond, and I have no way of knowing whether any pebble caused the slightest ripple. I don't need to worry about that. My responsibility is the effort. Thank you, and God bless.